This is a presentation of the University of Wisconsin Parkside. And stands up for LGBT people. 
So this is kind of just a general overview. Um, there are multiple other definitions in the handout, and please feel free, if you have a question throughout the presentation, to just ask. <clears throat> so just a brief overview about um, what I'm going to be talking about. Basically, I've structured my presentation in terms of the competencies. So I'll be going over most of the civic honors competencies and um, kind of explaining how I've demonstrated them. Um, I plan on ending with talking about my future plans. <clears throat> so um, one of the first issues was public issues affecting local and global communities. Um, starting with UW Parkside, um, basically, UW Parkside, I was able to find an article dating back from 1972 about gay livers. Um, this is actually one of the only things I found in archives. And it was a really interesting article that um, kind of talked about um, the minority group at Parkside that just started. This organization was actually started just a few years after Parkside was founded. And um, it consisted, they talk about the two gay livers that started the organization. Um, the campus response was people wondered if the, the organization was even legal on campus. Um, and the organization was created to combat the old queer syndrome. So I just thought that um, like the terminology and definitions that were used in this article were really interesting for 1972. Um, before I go into a little more about the Parkside climate, um, I think it's important to note that just before this organization was started, in 1969, the Stonewall Riots happened in New York City. Basically, um, police in New York um, raided the Stonewall Inn, and that was a gay club that um, they basically didn't have a liquor license and they were selling alcohol. And that was the police's re reasoning for going in. Um, and basically, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and some of the transgender people in the club actually kind of struck back and um, this was kind of known for um, the formation of the Gay Liberation Front. Right after this incident, there were multiple street demonstrations throughout the United States. Um, I know I was able to find some trace of like demonstrations even in Madison on this shortly after. Um, following this a year later, in <coughs> actually in the 1980s, um, the Allied organizations began to form on college campuses. And, um, like I said, this was really the incident that sparked the gay liberation. Um, so I have to say, before talking more about UW Parkside, it would be really unfair to be able to um, cover any LGBT issues that have been on campus. Um, I've been here since I was a freshman in 2006, so I'll talk a little bit about um, you know, what I have seen on campus. Um, basically, um, the campus has a campus climate survey, and this was done in the spring of 2010. This was designed to get personal experiences in regards to climate issues, people's own perceptions of the campus climate, um, and also student and employee satisfaction, and they wanted to know how people perceived and viewed the campus climate. Um, basically, more than one-fourth of, of all respondents indicated that they were aware or actually um, observed harassment on campus in regards to harassment of people within the LGBT community. Um, the survey also found that people of color and sexual minorities were more aware of perceived harassment. <coughs> um, UW Parkside also has a new Parkside Promise. Um, this was initiated by our new chancellor. And um, section D is kind of in regards to diversity. It reads that inclus inclusiveness and diversity permeates all policies, procedures, programs, services, decisions, and student, faculty, and staff experiences. Um, this is really, really big for Parkside. Um, I know that they've spent a lot of time on um, building this plan. And um, some of the goals for fall 2010, the first goal is to create a campus climate in which individuals are respectful, aware, and appreciative of inclusiveness and diversity. I know that um, the LGBTQ Resource Center here on campus is doing a lot of programming. And also, um, additionally, there's a lot of 
different um, diversity programs going on in the Office of Multicultural Student Affairs. The second goal for fall of 2010 is to hire a senior diversity officer. Um, they are currently in the process of doing a search and screen for that position. And that's really, really crucial for kind of bringing together um, all of the different diversity initiatives on campus. Um, the third um, goal for fall 2010 is to complete the equity scorecard for um, the UW system. The scorecard is basically an initiative created by the UW system and it kind of wants to track and see where they're at in terms of serving the underrepresented communities. So, that is the Parkside Promise. <clears throat> okay, so the first, um, one of the first competencies is awareness of public issues um, that are affecting the local and global communities. Um, in the United States, one of the first one that I would like to talk about is marriage equality in Wisconsin. And that's kind of what I've talked about already. Um, that involves the legislation in 2006 regarding the constitutional amendment. Um, I think that there is still a future. The amendment did not pass. Um, but there still is hope, and I'm hoping like, eventually that we can um, educate others more on the legislation and that they can look, really look into the wording that is really, really crucial in terms of passing and changing leg legislation is that is making sure that it's, you know, that people can understand it. Um, additionally, marriage equality in Wisconsin, um, apart from that is um, LGBT parenting. And <clears throat> a lot of times there's a lot of different stereotypes and myths that go around with LGBT parenting. Um, a sociologist by the name of Herrick um, published a study in 1991, and he stated that beliefs held by LGBT people are not based in personal experience, but rather they're culturally transmitted. So basically, if a person you know, can talk about the myths and believe in um, what people are saying, the myths about um, LGBT parenting, it's not because they know someone, it's just because of what's going around in the culture. Um, additionally, there's a psychologist by the name of Paul Cameron, and he has published multiple studies um, stating that gay parents produce gay children. Um, <laughs> very interesting. Um, this has been proven false multiple times in many studies. <clears throat> another, um, another stereotype or myth that is going on with LGBT parenting is also about that LGBT parents are mentally ill they're less maternal and they cannot be parents. Um, Patterson in 1986, um, he did multiple studies on this and he said that was incorrect. Um, additionally, gays in the military has been a very big topic, especially recently in the news. Um, basically when the United States was preparing for World War II, um, they started initiating psychiatric screenings for um, people. And in 1942, they um, revised some regulations and included for the first time a paragraph that actually um, differenti differentiated a homosexual versus a normal person. And um, the draft actually clarified procedures for rejecting gay draftees. <clears throat> in 1983, um, President Clinton asked the Secretary of Defense to draft a proposal that ended discrimination. And the Secretary of Defense did propose something to Senate. It was very controversial. And kind of as a compromise, um, the Senate ended up passing the don't ask, don't tell policy. Basically, that states that the military personnel would not be asked about their sexual orientation. Um, they would not be discharged simply for being gay. However, the policy did say that if anyone was caught doing any sexual acts, that they would immediately be discharged. You can kind of hear that in the news recently. I know um, <clears throat> once um, we had soldiers in Afghanistan, there were a couple soldiers that were sent back home immediately um, because of their sexual acts. Um, and most recently, this fall, the Pentagon did a study, and um, they wanted to see what the effects of coming out in the military were. And in a study that was published on December 2nd in 2010, um, CBS declared that the Pentagon study said that the effects of the policy 
determined that allowing gays to serve openly would not have any long-lasting consequences on the military. Um, moving on, actually I wanted to also talk about <clears throat> LGBT suicide. And LGBT, LGBT suicide, basically um, there's a lot of evidence and research that suggests when compared to their heterosexual counterparts, gay men and lesbians suffer from more mental health um, problems, including substance disorders, affective disorders, and suicide. Um, that was published in a 2001 study by um, Poltron. And studies have also indicated um, that an explanation for the cause of the higher prevalence of these disorders um, is basically because of the prejudice and discrimination that create a stressful social, social situation. Um, and that was published in 1999 by a study by Friedman. Um, so another competency within the Civic Honors Program is knowledge of one public issue. And like I said, my issue is allies. So what is an ally? Um, I've talked a little bit about what I've done, kind of my advocacy and my political work. And um, basically an ally works to end oppression um, personally and professionally. Um, through my research, I've realized that there are so many different definitions of allies, it's really hard for me to relate to just one definition. Um, basically, one way to look at it is an ally is a person from a dominant group that joins and unites with a member of an oppressed group because that member understands and appreciates the struggle. That was a 1991 definition by Washington and Evans. Um, however, I don't know, I guess a lot of the ally definitions out there are also different. Um, and one thing that I did learn was that in a study in 2008, they did say that there are more allies um, that are coming up in the younger community for the LGBT community. So more younger people are becoming allies, which is really good. Um, I also learned that our society is heterosexist. So most people grow up with unexamined heterosexist assumptions and attitudes. Um, and the process of being an ally is the movement from heterosexism to alliance. One thing that I did learn as an ally is that allies are often in common um, considered a straight ally in the LGBT community. However, it can be people within the LGBT community. I know here at Parkside, um, I got really involved with Rainbow Alliance. And just three years ago, there was an organization that wanted to form called Queer People of Color. And it was very controversial, and people wondered why we needed another gay group on campus. Um, and as a student ally, I kind of learned <coughs> through talking to people that being out and gay in the black community is much different than being in the white community. And just the differences in support and understanding are kind of some of the reasons for that. So that was something new to me, is the queer people of color. Now, there's various different ally development models. Um, this is one from McWhorter, and it has eight different steps, and it can range from active oppression to challenging heterosexist systems. Um, I kind of learned that active oppression would be maybe laughing at jokes, um, and then that can kind of move eventually to learning and starting to research about the issue and about issues that the LGBT community faces. Um, eventually, challenging the heterosexist systems, this can be, um, you know, through practices, through your work, maybe employers um, starting to add domestic partnership benefits on um, with insurance, um, various things. Challenging oppression, um, that can be really important with having workshops, and um, that is something that I've done and I'll talk about more, is giving workshops, educating others, doing research on your own and going above and beyond that. Um, joining an ally support network is also um, one of the steps. And New York and Parkside does not have an ally support network. However, we are really excited. Um, the LGBTQ Resource Center is in the process of applying for a mini grant through the Parkside Promise to do an ally power um, workshop. So we're really excited about that. And additionally, the LGBTQ Center has multiple different programs, and they are doing an ally video featuring students 
um, staff and faculty next next spring. Great. Um, so basically back to the groups and networks um, that have the ability to impact the issue. There are numerous uh, pro-LGBT and anti-LGBT groups throughout Wisconsin. Um, for UW Parkside, um, there are so many different organizations. I know, just thinking off the top of my head, um, Rainbow Alliance has done a lot of work with working with the Parkside Student Government. Parkside Student Government, um, in their constitution, they do allow, um, <clears throat> the Parkside Student Government allows members of, one member from every minority organization on campus to have a seat in the Senate. And this is where um, student activism has really come into play with the Rainbow Alliance spot um, of the organization. Um, with that, Rainbow Alliance has fought for many different things. Um, I remember two years ago, an issue that came up in Senate was um, getting gender neutral bathrooms on campus. Um, there was a lot of debate throughout the Senate. And eventually, student life did get involved, and they were able to guarantee the campus one gender neutral restroom in the student center. Um, additionally, the topic of LGBT housing was brought up in Senate last year, or two years ago, I'm sorry. Um, it's a concept, UW Madison has housing just for LGBT community, um, and that was tabled, and it has not been brought up in Senate again. Um, Additionally, um, the UW system, we, students have fought really hard for the LGBTQ Resource Center, and the reason that it is on campus is because of our students. Um, basically, in 2007, students said, we need an LGBT center. They brought the issue to the Dean of Students, and he said, okay, create the positions, create a budget. So there were three or four really active students that dedicated their time and effort and created a job descriptions, a budget for the center, plan, a yearly plan, and then they proposed that. And finally, um, that was accepted by the Dean of Students. Um, after figuring out funding, um, the LGBT Center was able to open in May 2008. We brought in Anna. And um, they provide programming and support for the campus. <clears throat> Additionally, within the UW system, there is the Inclusivity Initiative. And um, this is created throughout the UW system, and they're there to enhance communication and to, um, to make sure that everyone is in the loop with various diversity initiatives that are going on in the state. Um, also within Wisconsin, we have um, an LGBT center right here in Racine. Um, like I've mentioned before, there's Fair Wisconsin. And there's also the Human Rights Campaign um, and the Gay Straight Alliances for Safe Schools. It's also very important. Um, in terms of anti-LGBT, um, actually, this is a picture right here on campus. Um, there's a group called the Faithful Soldier School of Evangelicism. And this is an organization of people that come to campus every year. Um, it is a school located in Milwaukee. People from the United States actually come and fly in through the school. They do a lot of training on um, biblical history, and they focus a lot on the traditional family, homosexuality, um, abortion, and um, evolution also. So they usually come and talk about all of those issues. Um, usually they are peaceful demonstrations. However, students usually do come up and talk to them, have a lot of questions, um, and it's always a poster campaign. Um, also throughout the United States, there's Abiding Truth Ministries. This is a very small organization out of Mississippi. Um, and actually the founder of the organization has been very active in the anti-homosexuality bill that has been going on in Uganda. So that is one of the global, the organizations in the US that actually reaches globally. Additionally, there's the American Family Association. And they really focus on having a website and thousands of listeners to their online radio. One of the organizations through that is Dr. James Dobson. Um, he runs Focus on Family. And um, I've had a personal connection. Um, my baby's out for a family. They always listen to him. They have his books. Um, and as an ally, I can just, you know, really, you know, be there for the kids and teach them just to love in general. So. All right. Um, 
just very briefly, another one of the competencies is um, successful community organizing. Um, I had the opportunity to go to a workshop that was put on by the Gens of Our Foundation, and the Midwest workshop was put on in Minnesota. And I learned about the seven principles of community organizing. Um, most importantly that I have found as an ally is that it's really important um, for reflecting and evaluating. Um, a lot of that involves talking with others, listening to people, see what they perceived out of my presentations and my workshops that I've done. Um, I also learned about the importance of having a strong vision. Um, I learned that it's really good to have a clear and simple vision. And my vision as an ally is to educate others and to generate an understanding and an acceptance of the LGBT community. <clears throat> Um, so now I'm just going to talk about a little bit about what I've done to inform the various audiences. Um, there's no way that I can talk about everything that I've done, so I've just kind of pulled out um, some of the academic um, presentations that I have done. One of the most influential opportunities that I had was um, to go to multiple um, LGBT conferences with Rainbow Alliance. One of the great things with Rainbow Alliance is that they are able every year to budget to send students throughout the Midwest to various different workshops and conferences. And that's where I learned a lot about um, the up and coming issues within the LGBT community. Um, so starting with Safe Zone Trainings 2008, um, I worked with the LGBT Center as a Safe Zone facilitator. Um, Safe Zone pretty much works with um, various <coughs> staff and students that want to create a more safe and understanding um, environment for their students. Um, I also put on a workshop on how to be an ally and on the effects of coming out in the LGBT community. Um, this was all generated from information that I learned at LGBT conferences. Um, in 2010, I gave a presentation on intersex justice. Um, and basically, intersex means um, it's a condition that people are born with um, and I learned that a lot of times um, family members are not provided with resources when their baby is born with an intersex condition. There are multiple different conditions, some of them aren't even, don't even have a name. And basically a lot of times um, doctors really force or encourage parents to immediately um, get surgery for the newborn babies or um, suggest that later in life they go on hormonal treatments. Um, so in the presentation, I kind of focused on some of the words to avoid within the intersex community. Um, the two most common ones are hermaphrodite and ambiguous genitalia. These are generally used um, by medical professionals. However, um, actually recently, um, two years ago, there was an Olympic athlete by the name of Castor Semena, and they did an article on her because it was released and everyone found out that um, she was a person with an intersex condition. And the article in the New York Times uh, used the word or hermaphrodite. Um, so I did email the author and I actually got a response back from him. Um, I just kind of educated him on, you know, that the term is not really respected in the intersex community and that the word intersex is more appropriate. And he actually responded back and said thank you and I did not know that. So. <laughs> um, I also did a presentation for my Cuban literature class um, on queers in Cuba. Um, here is a um, quote by Guillermo Cabrera Infante. He's a Cuban novelist, and he said that those that have suffered most under Castro are the homosexuals expelled from their jobs, forced to marry, put in prison, and interned in concentration camps. Um, basically, one of the shocking things that I learned in my research was that there was this thing called Plan Fidel in 1968, and it was a plan created by Castro um, where the men, where homosexual men were incarcerated, um, and basically military officers attempted to turn them into real men. There's this concept called um, machismo, which is a sexual identi identity um, defined in terms of masculinity, and um, that's kind of like one of the stemming issues of homosexuality in Cuba is because of the machismo. I also learned um, within, the, within the AIDS epidemic, um, Cuba has done really a lot of work to control AIDS and HIV. Um, initially, 
1985 to 1986, or sorry, 1985 to 96, um, they had what was called these, um, they were basically called aid sanatoriums, and it's where they required anyone that was diagnosed with HIV to live. Um, they were provided with shelter, proper nutrition, and actually some of the best medical practices for HIV. Um, initially, you can kind of think that's like a bad thing to make people do such a thing, but really the treatment and care that they got is actually some of the best in the world. Um, they did stop the internment camps, and now, they, now Cuba does provide um, housing for AIDS and HIV patients. Um, I also did a paper called A Little Bit of Everything in the Queer World. Um, this was done for my Communication and Gender course. And here I interviewed um, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender students. Most of them were here from Parkside. And I wanted to know how their perception of their gender role um, changed, or if it changed, when they came out. Um, basically, here I have a quote from one of the students. Coming out allowed me to be, be myself. After I found myself, I found my perception of gender expanding beyond two gender system. And it really changed everything for me. Um, I learned Wood, um, who is a communication scholar, um, stated that gender role is often involves um, outward expressions of what society considers masculine or feminine. And I kind of realized that a, a person's coming out experiences, there's no way to kind of group or classify or say what coming out does for a person's perception of gender role because of everyone's background. Everyone's background is very different. For example, I had a student um, that said coming out was really difficult for him because um, his parents were very Christian and so he had kind of had to deal with that. Um, so basically in my conclusions, I said that there's nothing, you can't really group or say that one member of the LGBT community has it this way and the other has it this way because it's really based on everyone's background, which is very unique. Um, now, the last thing that I did for my civic honors presentation um, was actually happened this summer. There was an article in my um, local Matchbox newspaper and um, it was titled, Valor's Gay Teen Claims Death Threats and Taunting. This was actually before the five LGBT suicides that have been in the national media, um, before those were published. And this was a student um, in a very small white agricultural community who reported getting, having death threats and taunting from other students. When he reported this to the police, um, police the police chief actually told them, it's just part of growing up. This bullying is part of being in high school. Um, I was really, really shocked about this, and it wasn't until the student took this to the press that um, actions um, that the school board actually initiated um, expelling some of the students. So that really, really shocked me. Um, and then on top of that, the LGBT bullying and suicide stories have um, started to come out in the national media. Um, after reading about this, I wanted to do something, and I knew that being from the Manitowoc area and being an ally, I thought it would be really great to offer the high school um, an opportunity to train the kids on uh, some LGBT anti-bullying presentation. Um, basically, I contacted the, the principal. We were in contact several different times, and the principal simply told me that the students were too busy, they worked too much, and they're too busy with sports, and that such a training could not happen, and it's usually planned a year in advance. This really shocked me. Um, I, fortunately, um, the principal did pass me on to the coordinator of Healthy Manitowoc 2010, which is a grant for the Manitowoc County. The woman, uh, the coordinator of the grant, was very open and um, really wanted to know more about my presentation. She ended up sending my um, a presentation proposal to all guidance counselors in the state of Wisconsin. I got five um, inquiries back, most recently it's been up to five, um, and I did have the opportunity to give a bullying presentation to a middle school in the nominee. Um, basically, it was four groups of seventh graders, a total of 120 students, and my presentation was called Thank, you, Thank Before You Speak. Basically, um, it was a presentation created by the Gay, Lesbian, Straight Educational Network. Um, I did a first activity, um, it was called Where Do You Stand? 
and they read various statements using gay terminology, and students said if they agreed or disagreed. We kind of used that as the icebreaker, and the second activity was really talking about the various roles within bullying situations. There's a target, there's a bystander, there can be an ally, and there's a bully. And so the students discussed that. And um, in conclusion, we also talked about how a person can, can transform from being a bystander to an ally. Um, it was really, really interesting for me to see how the groups reacted. Initially, I was really kind of concerned that they wouldn't be talking very much, you know, having a stranger come into the school. Students were very talkative. Um, and the presentation really helped them make some connections between bullying in the, in, outside of school and in school. We talked about bullying situations within the home um, also. And um, I personally, it was a learning experience for me to hear the students talk about Facebook bullying. I had no idea that bullying on Facebook for seventh graders was such a big deal. Um, so all in all, it was really a learning experience on both ends. Um, I'm still waiting to hear back feedback um, from the students. They're mailing them in the mail. Um, but it was a really positive experience. A few of times I did run out of time in some of the sessions. Every, every group was different. Um, we all talked about different things. Um, but overall, it was a great opportunity. And that's just the beginning. Um, basically for my future and after I graduate, I still want to continue with these anti-bullying workshops and presentations. Um, I've been in contact with the Korean City Foundation in Milwaukee. Um, they heard about my presentation and they are very eager to set up a meeting time and talk about some activities and potential activities. Um, additionally, um, I would still like to continue to reach out to the schools that have contacted me. Um, I was offered a position at DeVry University for after I graduate, and I will be working there. Um, and I want to continue in the higher education field and continue to be um, an ally in my professional life. Um, I would absolutely love the opportunity to possibly be an advisor to an LGBT organization in the campus, um, and basically just continue to educate others throughout my daily life um, as well. So that is what I have. So thank you very much.